I want to tell people not to be afraid of speaking up because we feel like, oh, if I don't know the history exactly or if I don't know the numbers or the statistics, so maybe I'm not the right person to speak up. But the truth is that on the other side, they don't care about statistics or numbers or facts and they still speak up. And if we won't speak up, they would be the ones that are dominating. So I think it's up to us to really speak about it. And again, the pride is so important. All right, so today on Habits and Hustle, we have Hen Mazig, who is the senior fellow editor at Tel Aviv Institute and who has been putting out tremendously just fantastic content um, with regards to what's happening um, with Israel and Gaza. And I really wanted to have a conversation with you because I've been, I'm a big fan of yours. Like I said earlier, before we started even recording, uh, you really have been doing such a tremendous job on on basically t t tell, b giving the real facts and history of what's happening. And like I said, I couldn't be, I I'm so grateful that you are having this conversation with me and my audience. So thanks for being here, Hen. Thanks for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure and, and thank you for everything you're doing. I mean, at this time, I feel like it's very hard for a lot of people to speak up um, for whole lot of reasons, but um, it's couldn't, I mean, I don't think it was ever as more important as it is now. I mean, I'm glad that you said that because I want to get into all of that. I want it, but before, before I even do that, can we just tell people what does the Tel Aviv Institute do and what is your, like, what do you do there? And so I think that's a good place to begin. Yeah, so I'm um, the co-founder and senior fellow at the Tel Aviv Institute. I, um, together with Dr. Ron Katz, is an expert of rhetoric and propaganda from uh, University of California, Berkeley. Um, we founded the institute. Um, originally, it was just a research institute that was meant to research online antisemitism. Um, and we found that there is a lot of hate online. Um, but the, we've we've transitioned uh, from just researching the hate to coming up with solutions on how to combat it. Um, so we were writing messaging that we find that is more effective to fighting antisemitism and misinformation about Jewish people, uh, about Israel. Um, we are working with uh, social media influencers, uh, Jewish influencers, um, to give them uh, the the language and the messaging um, that they need uh, to speak up about these issues and, and supporting them um, in being more proud of their Jewish identity. We find that when people are more proud of their Jewish identity, um, anti-Semitism uh, that surrounds their account is redu is reducing tremendously. So if uh, if an influencer would hide his Jewish identity or her their Jewish identity, um, there would be more anti-Semitism around their account when they speak up about it is about being Jewish, we see that um, hate speech from their followers um, reducing um, a lot. So that's what we're uh, aiming to do. Oh, I didn't even realize that. So you're saying, because I feel like there's, first of all, I feel like there's definitely not enough people speaking out because of fear, fear of uh, cancel, being canceled, losing followers, all the such. I didn't realize what you do is you create messaging around that for people first of all that's i mean you can help me because i mean i'm having a lot of problems but i will say that i i said i tend to agree i feel like to cower like and and i feel like a lot of time what's happening right now is people are scared we're making excuses and, and they're as opposed to being strong and proud and so when you before we, before we started this podcast, you said, no, let me go get my Megan David so I can wear it. Uh, that kind of put a smile on my face because there is such a fear of people being proud of their Judaism. Some of it actually, to be honest, is now because of what's happening, there is a re there's reason behind it because of look, look what's look at the violence that's happening. Look what's happening at these, you know, in my I'm Canadian. My my nieces go to my, to Concordia University, and just uh, a couple days ago, there was like a whole thing happening there. There's shootings in school, Jewish schools. I mean, there is some element of why there is fear. How do you balance that out between being proud of being Jewish, Jewish, but also being um, somewhat like diligent in, in the fact that if you have a family, you've got kids, where is that happy balance of being proud and being careful? 
Yeah, that's that's a very good point. Um, and the reason that we're f- so focused on Jewish pride and, and empowering Jewish voices is um, because of that. It's very hard to be openly Jewish today, not only because of canceling, as you said, it's also because of real threat to your safety. I mean, um, we're hearing Jewish people changing their names on, on their Uber app or m- removing um, mezuzah. Yeah, that's why it was so important for me to, to put the Star of David on uh, and always wearing it when I go in the street. Um, and and I'm and I'm you know I'm, I live in London and it's uh, uh, it's not the safest place to be going around with the Star of David these days, um, which is a horrific statement by itself. Um, but I think that being ashamed or hiding ourselves and who we are will not help us. Um, I'm taking a page out of uh, um, Harvey Milk's um, uh, ideas. You know, as a as a gay person, I know that as if you're not speaking about your gay identity, you're not. Um, uh, to people and you're not open about it, it's going to contribute to a lot of stereotypes. And a lot of times when uh, I hear homophobic things being said around me, um, I have two options, either speaking up or, or not. And if I won't speak up, no one else would. Uh, and I think it's true also for Jews. Uh, in a sense, I, I call it coming out as Jewish. I think it's very important for us to speak up because once we speak up about our identity and we uh, and we are showing the world who we are, um, all the innuendos, all the lies, everything that people are saying about us are uh, are being shattered by us existing. Um, just the fact that you would go to the supermarket or the grocery store with uh, uh, with the Star of David, people would see, oh, this is a person, you know, that we see around us. There, we are such a tiny minority. Most people haven't even met a Jew in their life, or if they did, they didn't know. Um, but we can fix it by speaking up, by having conversation, by by just putting um, a Jewish star on your bio. That's a big step forward. Like that's what I encourage a lot of people to do: to just not be afraid, because this fear is contributing to uh, to a lot of those lies and misinformation about Jews and anti-Semitism to go out unchecked. Also, it it shows it shows a level of weakness, and I feel like what we have been doing as a group is. We're because we are we are compassionate. We're ethical, and we are we we've, we've lost. It's getting lost in translation because we're not fighting fire with fire, and it comes across as being weak, as opposed to being more militant and being much more uh, serious and aggressive. Just in the same way that they the other side is being right. Because look what they're creating. Right, they're creating with their they're louder, they're more aggressive, they're more assertive, and it's inviting other people to be to, to join along versus how, what, what we're doing as, you know, the, the, the Jewish people. And that's why I, I tend to agree. And what I've done is I've, I've gone like full on full force. And have I gotten backlash? Yes. But at the same time, what I want to tell people and what I tell people all the time when they when they say to me something, I say, you know what, honestly, it actually eliminates the fodder. It gets a, it gets it gets rid of the people that you honestly at your core, you have nothing in common with. And it brings people who you are very f- similar to closer together. That's how you build a true tribe, in my opinion. You get people like I've made a lot of friend like friendships and relationships with people I otherwise would never have even known because of what's happened, right? And yes, have I lost other people? Yes, but at the end of the day, they weren't my people anyway, so it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's so true. I mean, I... Uh, I've lost a lot of friends. People, I mean, I'm I'm as Israeli as they come and Jewish as they come. Right. Uh, still, people were shocked that I'm standing up for myself. But I mean, I'm thinking about all the other um, social justice causes that I've supported over the years, and I still support. I mean, I even if they don't support me, I still support equality and justice because that's who I am. I'm not being defined by the people that hate me. But I'm thinking, you know, I stood up for those causes because a lot, I think I was inspired by seeing people standing up for themselves. No one is going to stand up for us if we can stand up for ourselves. And I think if we want to get the support from everyone, we have to be the ones leading the chart. No one can do it for us. And, and I think that's why I saw a few campaigns calling, you know, calling non-Jews to uh, to feel bad for us or to uh, feel sympathy. And I, I don't think that's what should lead us. We We need to people need to support us because it's in their in their best interest not only because it's uh it, you know it's the right thing to do and it's and it's the just thing to do and they need to do it like it's uh, it's not because of sympathy or because they feel sad but I, I don't want them to hide me i want them to stand with us by our side while we are fighting and support us because that's 
what they should do, you know? I, I couldn't agree with you more. I don't think that the campaign should be about feel like feel bad for me, look at me, poor me, because I think that's that's getting the wrong messaging out as well. And I think it's interesting because when this first happened, I feel like that's what me and a lot of people were doing because it was we thought like we were like kind of trying to shake people like, don't you see what's happening? Like it's black or if this is a black and white situation, it's not gray. It's good versus evil. Don't you see? Look. And then like you're trying to like prove your point. And eventually you have to kind of like let that go and be like, and, and realize that you're you're basically speaking to an eco chamber. People are going to believe what they're going to want to believe and that that is not that's not effective. Right. And so I like that you said that. Can I ask you a question? Because you said something a little bit earlier that I I'm very curious about, you know, like, why is it you said that you were you're you're a gay Israeli man. Why is it that there are so many people like did you see the 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 queers for Palestine? Like, do they not understand that they would not last four and a half seconds if they went to Gaza? What is going on? Like someone sent me something actually yesterday. It said uh, queers for Palestine. Their their uh, their name would it, it would it be was were versus, you know, whatever it would be, because. Yeah. There's such a there's so many disconnects. How can you explain this to me? Because I don't get it. I really don't. Yeah, it's a it's a hard one to understand uh, or to comprehend. But I think that for a long time there has been a campaign of creating this uh, idea that Palestinians are the ultimate oppressed. Uh, people. Um, and of course, we know that in society, because of anti-Semitism, p- Jewish people are perceived to be the most powerful people. Um, so it, it worked perfectly with this campaign, the idea that um, LGBTQ people um, have to fight for every other oppressed minority. And of course, Palestinians are also oppressed, so they have to stand with them, um, even if they would kill them uh, for <laughs> for their identity. Uh, and it is bizarre. And, you know, I wasn't one to ever say that um, send them to Gaza or or say this stuff, but because I I don't think that you know it's not you can support a cause even if you disagree on some issues, but I think it's really telling that these people would take you know would weaponize their LGBTQ identity to fight for people that literally oppose their their all identity, and it's not just a fringe case. It's not just you know one case of people being killed in Palestine or in Gaza. Uh, it's it's system it's systematic. The 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 homophobia and anti-LGBTQ plus um, ideas in the Palestinian society are so prevalent that 93% of Palestinians think that being gay is uh, is immoral, and that's according to Pew Research. Um, it's not even it's not it has nothing to do with Israel. They just that's what they believe in. Just last year, uh, the international organizations, the UN, was asking. Palestinian workers in Gaza, because the UN is run by Palestinians in Gaza, they asked them to sign a statement that says that every person has uh, basically gender equality and LGBTQ plus rights uh, statement, and they rejected it. And all of the leaders of every working union and every organization uh, in in Gaza uh, were saying, don't let us discriminate against LGBTQ people. We want to continue doing it. And instead of calling that out, and that's, that's where I would understand, if you want to use your queer identity to speak up about issues of LGBTQ inequality, absolutely do that. And I would be supporting you for, for doing that. But if you're weaponizing your identity to fight for a political cause that have nothing to do with, and in fact is actually pushing our struggle back so many years, then I find it to be ridiculous. And I think that they should not only be ashamed of themselves, but they're actually harming Palestinian queer people because they are allowing the oppression of Palestinian queer people because they found some anonymous account online that said to them that they are queer. We know they're not, uh, they're, Palestinian queer people would not go online and speak about their identity. They're they're too afraid because the alternative is being is having their head cut off, and that's what happened to them. And that's the saddest part. I mean, is it is it ignorance though? Is it that people just don't know what they're even saying or what they're chanting or what they're believing in, and they 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 just kind of are going along with, you know, with being just someone who is fighting for social injustice. And the other part of my, that's one part of my question. And the other part of my question is when and how did with social injustice come the, the, that our, the, the anti-Semitism has become the antithesis of that. Isn't that like, again, that's another disconnect. 
Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, I mean, the, the truth is that standing up for Jewish people um, has never been popular. You know, anti-Semitism is always the popular cause. And that's uh, the other ridiculous lie that they feel like they're very brave to go against Israel or against uh, um, against Jews. Um, but that's that's the reality of anti-Semitism. It's always shape-shifting. And if in the past it was Jews are stealing your work, now it's Jews are controlling your uh, your economy, Jews are in Hollywood, or Jews are in all those places of power, uh, and not to appreciate it or to celebrate it. You know, people don't like when Jews are succeeding. Uh, or, or like there are Haron spoke, uh, people like that Jews, and it's coming from the idea that we shouldn't have power. When we have power, when Jews have power, uh, people feel very uncomfortable with that. They want us to be victims. That's why this uh, campaign of uh, uh, hide me um, for Jewish people, that it did well with non-Jews because for them, they want to feel bad for Jews. And then that's when they would feel comfortable with us. But it's not it's not going to help the Jewish community to feel to to be to victimize ourselves. Um, and I think that in general, in 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 social justice movement, um, the notion that Jews are this all powerful people, superhuman, has been so prevalent in so many of those uh, those movements. And it's a I think it's it's a wake up call for a lot of us in the progressive circles that are thinking, wait, we've we're completely have been dehumanized to the point that people don't even care if little girls are being violated and babies are being beheaded, that they would just say, okay, that's, I want to see proof. And even if they see proof, it's not enough. Or or they would take down posters of babies that are kidnapped. I mean, to get to the point that you would see a poster of a baby and that has been kidnapped and to take it down, uh, imagine the amount of uh, uh, campaigning and, and propaganda and brainwash brainwashing this these people have gone through uh, to the point that they, are, they see us as so... Uh, not human and so uh, um, and, and see anything that is done against us as legitimate because we are all powerful. And I think that's what we we have to change. We have to fight for our humanity. There's a campaign of uh, dehumanization and Jewish people have to fight against it. Absolutely. Did you see the campaign with uh, it was or a video, a reel? I think it, maybe I've seen it on your page because I, I keep on reposting everything that you everything that you do. I end up reposting. The, the guy was a, it was a pro-Palestinian protest and the guy put a, a, an Israeli flag on a dog, basically signifying that we're dogs, you know, we're animals, Jewish people. And again, it's become so desensitized. Nobody nobody even even looks at that anymore as something that is horrific or awful. Like the, the, the entire messaging has become so skewed. Now, you've been doing this Tel Aviv Institute for how many years? Uh, the Tel Aviv Institute, I started about four years ago, but I've been involved in this. I mean, I served for five years as a humanitarian officer to the Palestinian civilians in the West Bank, and I worked a bit in Gaza. Um, and then after that, I've started to be involved in the world of advocating for, for Israel and Jews. So I've been doing it for what, over 12 years now. Now, how much, I mean, because you said yourself, like, that we've always had a lot of anti-Semitism, people have always hated Jews. What have you, like, has, so this obviously doesn't surprise you, because it surprised me, I think it's surprising a lot of people, maybe because of the naivety we had, like, the naivete that we never experienced it before or saw it in our generation. So when it started to happen to this level, I think it should been, it's been very eye-opening. Um is there like research or data showing the percentage of how much worse it is now than it was even five years ago that you can yeah. share? Yeah, absolutely. It's, I mean, according to the Anti-Defamation League that actually um, research it, or actually, you know what, even according to the FBI, um, the, the Jewish people are the most targeted minority community um, of all of the um, religiously motivated hate crimes in America. And we're the smallest group. Um, so there is more attacks against Jews. I think it's 60 something percent uh, uh, of mm. the uh, anti um, religion, the, the religiously motivated hate crimes are against the Jewish community in America that are what 0.2 percent of the population, uh, but still are the majority. So and it's getting worse every year. And I think I've seen it getting worse from a point that people would were just on the fringe. And now it's becoming more mainstream and more consensus. And we're seeing it on MSNBC and on The New York Times. And and we're seeing more and more voices that 
used to be so radical. I remember in 2019 or 2016, where I was speaking in, uh, I was doing speaking tourism campuses in America, and there were maybe there were maybe one or two people protesting outside um, because I'm Israeli. But now it's so, and and that's a problem when you're when you're not fighting something that is on the fringe. Tomorrow it's going to be in the uh, uh, in the center of the conversation, and that's what we're seeing today. And I think the, the Jewish community has not gave enough um, focus to fighting this. And I think now we realize that, I mean, I've been shouting on on every rooftop I could that this is a problem and it's getting worse. Um, but now it's, I mean, the numbers are that, that it's the uh, worst year uh, in history of anti-Semitic hate crimes in America since the Holocaust. So what is you, like, can you give a, maybe a, like a salute, like how do we get people to be more engaged in speaking up? How do we get more Jewish people, more Jewish uh, influencers, uh, people with platforms to not be afraid, to not shy away from it, or to kind of, yeah, to get more involved in general? Is there, do you, is there a plan? Do you, besides, give me something. I mean, Hen, I, I, I'm at a loss myself. I'm screaming from every rooftop also, but do you have any a, a plan of action, how we can do this as a, as as someone who's been doing this for a long time yeah we're i was just on a call be, before this um meeting a bit before this uh the podcast um with uh a few leaders in the jewish community that are looking to create something larger um that will allow jewish people to have um to get the tools to speak up i think that's a big thing that is missing that's what i've been trying to do with my platform for the last month and i've been working non-stop um every day to create content and come up with the language that i feel like people need in this time uh, and to address issues that are out there um i would say just it's very important that we continue speaking up i mean I, there is a plan we're, we're thinking of we have an idea of um, um a platform that would um that would be an online one that will allow uh, Jewish people to communicate and support one another and and increase our um, visibility. Uh, I think that's what's missing right now. I think the Jewish people just need the words um, to to fight or to speak up, basically. Um, and it's uh, and I want to tell people not to be afraid of speaking up because we feel like, oh, if I don't know the history exactly or if I don't know the numbers or the statistics, so maybe I'm not the right person to speak up. But the truth is that on the other side, they don't care about statistics or numbers or facts and they still speak up. And if we won't speak up, they would be the ones that are dominating. So I think it's up to us to really um, uh, speak about it. And and again, the pride is so important. And, you know, I I, I was just sharing the story, but I'll, I'll share it. It's a quick one. But I um, I started learning how to uh, I learned how to swim this year. Never knew how to swim. Uh, I don't know. It wasn't something that I did as a kid. <laughs> Um, and my swimming instructors kept saying that when I swim, I, I fold myself inside. And he said, instead, you have to really open your chest and be almost proud in the water. And he said, it's very, you know, it's very uh, intuitive that there's water around you. You feel like you're going to sink. So you're curling yourself inside. But when you do, you do that, you're just falling deeper and the water is going to surround you and there's no, not going to be a way for you to float. So I think for us, and that's where uh, that's the analogy, is that the Jewish people feel like we are we are in deep water. There's so much hate around us, and if we just curl in and and be quiet, maybe we could float, or or maybe it will just pass. <laughs> and it's not going to. The only way to fight it is by being proud, by being with our chest up, uh, open. And I thought about it uh, the other day, and I think it's really what we need to do right now is the more Jews speak up, the easier it will be for the rest of us, and and it's also for. We need, we need to honor our ancestors. We need to honor um, our ancestors that survived genocide and survived the most horrific attacks on the Jewish people in history that we can think of. Um, and, and they've survived because they didn't bow down and they kept fighting and they kept celebrating life. That's that's what we need to do as Jewish people to honor them and for the future generations. I love that. Thank you. And I like that analogy of the swimming because it's true, right? Uh, it's great. I and I what I also wanted to talk to you about something that just happened yesterday or recent yesterday I saw. Uh, because you do so much. You don't you don't really post anything unless you do a lot of background checking, fact checking. And that's what I really admire about you. I wanted to ask you something about the idea that I saw photojournalists, journalists from CNN, AP, Reuters, 
who were there on March, on October 7th, watching the massacre, videoing, basically videoing the, the massacre. Now, is that actually accurate? Was Is that true? And then you see this picture, by the way, of one of the photojournalists kissing one of the Hamas uh, terrorists. Now, I, I didn't know if that was, that was so disturbing. Is that accurate information? Yeah, I mean, if they if they were there when the massacre happened, they were at the border. Uh, there were videos of one photojournalist holding a grenade. Um, but it's important to understand that those photojournalists, the journalists in Gaza, the local ones, yeah. uh, are Palestinian journalists. And um, just like any other Palestinian in Gaza, they are also afraid of Hamas. Um, and a lot of them are um, are also embedded in some of those uh, project. So I, I heard, um, I think it was uh, one of the Israeli members of the parliament said that if a journalist is participating in a massacre or, or if even documenting uh, the kidnapping of of, uh, um, of innocent civilians without stopping it, without calling for help, they're complicit. And I think that's true. I mean, yes, of course, journalists have the responsibility to document and to send out information. But it's very and and the reason that I haven't posted about it is because I wasn't um, I'm not I'm not fully sure. I mean, of course, it's terrible, um, but I'm just still trying to find out more information um, to um, to to bring this to to make sure that it's the clearest way possible to people, because um, it is horrific when people uh, are participating in something like this without stopping it. But it's also the responsibility that they have to take photos of it. However, how did they know to be there at 6 a.m. and to take photos and videos? And why does one of the journalists is holding a grenade in his hand? And why are you kissing the leader of Hamas? And then some journalists uh, from Reuters and others um, have said that um, the reason that for this photo with the leader of Hamas, a, ter a designated terrorist organization in every Western country, um, uh, is that um, they were trying to get closer to them or they were uh, trying to get closer to sources of information. I don't buy this either. I think that if you are uh, a journalist, you have to have respect some standards. So I know that CNN and, and AP have announced that they're not going to work with this journalist and AP actually removed some of the photos, but it's telling you a bigger story here, the, the automatic belief of everything that's coming out of Gaza without it realizing that Hamas is the one that is controlling both the journalists, the international organizations. And that's, you know, we saw that the international um, media used to cover the casualties and say it's the it's the Gaza Ministry of Health. And we knew that it was Hamas. And a lot of people said this is Hamas. And then they changed it. And they said, well, it's actually the numbers are coming from Save the Children. Save the Children in Gaza is run by Palestinians that are in the same situation like any other Palestinian in Gaza. They live under Hamas rule. And if Hamas finds out that they are saying something that they don't like, they're going to kill them. They've done that. Um, and then they change it to the UN, but also the UN is run by Palestinians in Gaza. So there's really no credible source of information. That's why the numbers of the casualties are identical to the ones of the uh, of Hamas, that the ones that are the international community is reporting. But we know it's fake. We know it from the El Hali Hospital, where in October 17th the hospital was uh, uh, was blew up. Well, the the parking lot of the hospital. The first claim was that Israel did it, and the numbers were uh, 600, 700, 800 people were, were killed when they thought they could blame it on Israel. But then when uh, the truth came out that it was actually the, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad that was behind it, the number is closer to 12. So I think that's really the, the whole misinformation campaign of Hamas. They, they're masters in manipulating and, and terrorizing, not only physically, but also mentally. And that's what they're doing now as well. I mean... It really was mind boggling when I saw the fact that the those journalists from CNN, AP, Reuters were there an hour early waiting, waiting for them to come and do the massacre. And to me, I, you said to me, you said, well, CNN is not going to use the pictures now or they're not going to do that. that. Who cares? That's not the point. The point is there is an ethical responsibility or you are considered to be complete. Like, that means they knew beforehand that this was happening and then nobody's taking act more, more action towards these people. I mean, that to me is just mind boggling. And, and then the other part of, of this is the fact that he was like the, the kissing and the holding of the hand grenade. Why is that just, no one is like that. Those people should be, it, it, why is the FBI not talking to them? Why are they not like, what, what's, why is nothing happening beyond basically CNN 
saying they're not going to use a foot, like the, 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 the pictures. And like, to me, that's not enough. And also, did you see that thing about New York Times when they, the, the guy, there was a, another person that they hired, even though they, he spoke that he was anti-Semitic and he hated Jews. And now they, they rehired him to be, to be uh, out there basically reporting on this. Like, what is going on here? It's crazy. And it's coming from everywhere. And it's this idea that Palestinians cannot be held accountable, right? It's right. the idea that if there is war crimes and international violation a violation of international law, Palestinians will never be held accountable. We're not even talking about what Hamas did. We're immediately speaking about whether or not Israel used some lightning bombs that have some white phosphorus in them, uh, and if that's uh, violating international law. You know what violating international law? Raping little girls and beheading babies. Like, that's violating international law, and the, and the media is completely ignoring it, and they're ignoring anti-Semitism in a way that is unforgiv unforgivable. And I think the Jewish community must speak up about it. But it's true. It's just it's mind boggling. But it's uh, it's the state that we are and that we're at. And I think that's why it's so bad and so scary. The fact that that's not even made a bigger of a deal, like the fact that, you know, you know, maybe a few people are posting it. Some Jewish people are posting about it yesterday. But I have not seen anybody else talk about it in, in, on a grander scale. And it's just being like repressed and 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 just kind of buried like everything else. I, I mean, that to me in itself is just horrifying. Just I, I I don't even know how. So what can we like? Is how do you even? I guess the truth is like how do you even fight that? Like how do are like how do the is how does Israel even tr even attempt to fight that type of uh, media propaganda? And the fact that they, now that we even know that there's potential that they knew about this even beforehand, I, I, I doesn't. What do you do, Han? I'm I'm looking to you. Yeah, and I'm, I'm I'm and I appreciate it, and I try to give all the answers that I can. But the truth is that I, with all of my experience, I'm also a bit at a loss of words for some of the things that we're seeing. I mean, uh, Jennifer, we're still asking if if a chant for the genocide of Jewish people, if it's a if it's a bad thing or not. I mean the. We yeah. have Congress people that are uh, debating if it's uh, if anti-Semitism is okay or not. We have, you know, the the media is is a big part of it. The, the international organizations are part of it, and um, the younger generation is a part of it, and the Congress is a part of it. Some Congress people are a part of it. So it's just a, a massive fight, and I think we can all just do our part. And I I'm trying to do my part. You're doing our, your part. I think. I think speaking up is is cannot be underestimated because it's so important. I mean, every post, every time we put something out there, it makes such a huge difference. Um, I I see it. I see how the the conversation is changing by us just putting this information out there. And I and I think even that this issue with the with the photographers is is a big deal, and it's going to make people think twice now when they read information from um, uh, from Gaza. And that's what the Hamas and their we know that Hamas is not doing it by themselves. They have support from Iran and from Russia. Um, but a lot of their campaign on social media is to is to sow doubt in people's minds and and to um, I mean that the reason that there's so many bots that asks us for uh, a proof of uh, if a girl has been violated or not or the babies is another another way of distracting us from the real conversation. Why are we even defending that? Why are we telling people that? Um, a girl was actually violated. Why do they want to see a video of a girl being violated? Whenever did that happen? You know, and meanwhile, we know that Hamas is controlling the journalists in Gaza, and we know that they're faking a lot of the information and a lot of the photos that we're seeing out of there. And yet it is true that a lot of Palestinians suffer. It's important to recognize that, but they're suffering because of Hamas. Hamas can end all of this tomorrow if they just release the hostages and surrender, like we ask from every leaders of terror group, that's what the goal is. And that's what America was doing in, in every time it's fought a war. That's why that's what the UK was doing, uh, Britain was doing in World War II. They demanded the, the Nazis surrender. And that's what Israel is doing now. We're demanding Hamas would surrender and give us the hostages. That's I mean, the fact that the hostages are not even the main part of the story, that 240 <laughs> people are held in tunnels in Gaza and we're hearing ideas of, oh, well, Israel is going to bomb them. No, they're underground in Gaza. We know exactly where they are. Israel is not bombing them. Uh, and, and the Palestinians that are living there and refuse to leave because of Hamas or Hamas not letting them, which again, heartbreaking, tragic. What would you want us to do? What would you do if it was your son, your mother, your 
family member held in Gaza underground? Would you say to your leaders, oh, well, you know, just be careful because it doesn't matter. My, my kids can rot underground in, tu- in tunnels. Like, how, how are we even having this conversation? But I think all of it is just a... Uh, it's meant to distract distract us uh, and meant to make us, uh, and it's exhausting. Uh, it's mentally exhausting to go over and over again on these things. I, at this point, I just, whenever someone is trying to gaslight me, I'm just blocking them or, or restricting them. Restricting them. Uh, I think everyone should do that. I mean, if you're, uh, don't waste time on justifying to people that can't see your humanity, um, justify to them anything. They You don't owe them anything. I totally agree. I think people it's like it's part of the it's part of the PR plan or the tactics is to gaslight you, distract you, to make you defend what you shouldn't even have to be defending. And the entire messaging, I I mean, very true. I no one's even talking about the you know, where the hostages are, release the hostages. All I hear is ceasefire, ceasefire. But yes, but what about the hostages? And the, again, we can talk all day about the propaganda and the nonsense of what's, what's going on. Um, and, you know, I, at this point, I, I guess like we're all at a loss at this point, right? Like we, we, I mean, we can only do what we can do and keep on speaking as loud as we can and, and really kind of try to implore people to do, to keep on speaking. Um, wait, the, let's, could we just talk about the hostages for one second here? Cause uh, again, there's not enough coverage, I think, on, on the hostages. How did that, that message get so uh, just suppressed? Like, why is that even why is the main, main news source is not even talking about that when they talk about a ceasefire? Yeah, I mean, like over 200 people, like over 200 babies, women, elderly women, uh, I spoke yesterday to a mother that her child, if he doesn't get his injection once a month, is is going to s- suffer from severe allergy, and she's worried because he's is missing two shots at this point. Uh, I've heard, spoke to a, a father that um, is his children and he, and his wife are uh, three children and, and his wife are held in Gaza by Hamas. Um, and I mean, I'm trying to think for a second of the human catastrophe and like for, I'm just trying to put myself, I would never be able to, but to put myself in his shoes and try to understand what they've been going through. You know, a, a second is too much. A minute is too much to have your kids held by these people, uh, to have your your daughter held by people that violated her in, in gunpoint, uh, in, in tunnels. And we're, we're not talking about it. The media is not talking about it. We're forgetting about it. And those people suffer so much and it has to be the center of the conversation right now. Um, it can't be about, and I'm sorry, it can't be about anything else. Of course, every human life is important. And I, I don't accept that um, the idea that we should kill people because of that, but we should eliminate Hamas. And if people get hurt because they haven't evacuated or because Hamas has held them uh, over the where the hostages are being kept, that's that's on Hamas. It's definitely not on Israel. And we shouldn't be the ones explaining it. We shouldn't be the ones that are even engaging in this conversation. It's all Hamas. You have problem with the casualties in Gaza. You need to address it to Hamas. What you can do right now is pressuring Hamas to to release the hostages. When we speak about ceasefire, people need to realize you can't just shout ceasefire because ceasefire means to those families the the certain death of their kids, the certain death of their family members. If we will ceasefire with an organization that has committed some of the worst atrocities, some of the worst crimes against humanity that we've seen in modern time anywhere in the world, if you are advocating for a ceasefire, you're advocating to kill those people and we can't allow this to happen. Israel has the responsibility, not the right. And that's really important. Israel has, It's not about Israel having the right and does have the right according to international law to, to fight. And, and when Hamas is using a hospital as a, a shelter for their bombs, uh, this hospital is no longer pro- protected according to the Geneva Convention, but I'm not even going there. Israel has the responsibility to each and every citizen to bring back those, those children, those babies, those families. There, it doesn't matter. Anything else doesn't doesn't go into this and it's not it's not even part of the conversation. The, the most important thing right now is that we bring back those hostages and to call for a ceasefire before their home is the most morally repugnant thing you can do. I, I, I could not agree with you more. And when people say that, I just, I, it just, again, this whole thing has been completely like a mind boggling experience. Why did they even, like in Europe, I'm curious, why did they even release 
two of the hostages, like the three of hostages they did. Like, what was the purpose to show that they're nice guys? Like, I, I, I'm confused by this. And people think, oh, no. and but look at it. Look how look how psychologically cuckoo this is. People thought, oh, nice. They're that's so nice of them. They've actually let a couple of few of them go. They're forgetting that we have 240 more that they've slaughtered of 1,400 people. Like, doesn't that even itself tell you something? Yeah, yeah, you're spot on. I mean, that's the psychological thing. That's what they're doing. They're um, they're releasing to and they're giving hopes to the rest of the families. And then they they release a video of some hostages um, that were calling on Netanyahu to stop the war, uh, which is we know that they're held in gunpoints by Hamas and Hamas is forcing them to say that. Uh, and then they're saying that they might release more. Uh, and then they, uh, you know, a few days ago, they said they're going to release 50. Then they said they're going to release 13. Then they're saying foreign nationalities because they know that this would create a divide between Israel and the world if they would only release the foreign nation and the, the ones that have foreign nationality, then maybe Israel would get into everything Hamas is doing is meant to um, to psychologically terrorize the world and Jews around the world and Israelis. And that's why we can't fall into it. And we have to demand that all of the hostages would be released. Um, and and that that would mean ceasefire. Again, when, when we speak about releasing the hostages, that's the only way to, to end this war. Um, ending, the, ending the war is not on the table until those, those families are back. Then we can speak about ceasefire. Then I would actually have a conversation about ceasefire. But first of all, the hostages have to be back home. Gosh, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, and then my other question is, why hasn't Israel taken the same approach like, like by now that they are using in terms of getting uh, the using AI, using all these things, like you basically fighting fire with fire, you know, like it's like the David and Goliath thing, right? Like we are still, they're still trying to play this ethical, compassionate, kind uh, approach and it's not working. And they are they are strong. Like it's like it's you would think because people have this ideology, like this ideology in their head that they're like these, they're these people living in these like tunnels and they're uneducated and they're dumb and they're not shrewd and they're just like learning how to shoot. But there's these people are very strategic, super smart, and cunning because they know exactly what to do to have that psychological war warfare, exactly how to get people to sympathize with them. I mean, I, I, it's, it, this is really like, it, this is a case study that I've never seen before in my life. Yeah. And I keep saying, I, I wish Jews controlled the media because then maybe the media would be on our side. Yeah, uh <laughs> <laughs> exactly. The, the irony, believe me, hasn't been lost on me. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think... I do understand the the argument that a lot of Israeli officials that I spoke to are making that um, um, you know we our identity is not like theirs. Our values are different, and we recognize like, theirs. I mean, like Hamas, um, we have different set of values that are leading us, and that's why they're not carpet bombing Gaza. By the way, when people speak about genocide, if Israel wanted to do a genocide, Israel could have done that. It's not an problem for Israel to destroy everything in Gaza and not leaving one person alive. And I completely reject that. It's not what we should do. It's not what we're doing. Uh, that's why it's not a genocide. This idea, this notion that it's a, a genocide or that Israel Israel has some uh, sinister agenda of, of taking over Gaza and we were just waiting for that. Like, Israel has no interest in controlling Gaza um, out of, I mean, Israel has uh, so much, uh, I mean, yeah, it, it's just the fact that I we have to discuss it, but it's important to say it. I, I, no, it's a, we have to say it's important to say it because I feel like like, but you're talking to like you're talking to like a an echo chamber, I guess, an echo chamber. Because how many times have I said in the gaslighting? We left in 2005. We handed them the keys. We said, here you go. They'd been given billions of dollars to do whatever the hell they wanted. And instead of building an infrastructure, they built weapons and and all sorts of mass destruction to kill. Jewish people. And yet as many times as you say that, people still say, you guys, you Jewish people, you Israelis are committing genocide. Are you kidding me? Like, again, like, that's why, like, to your point, the, the messaging has nothing to do with anything. Right. You know, you just, if you want to hate, if you, if you basically just want to hate Jews, just to say, just say what it is. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. Yeah. They're saying what it is. They're saying from exactly. the exactly. You know, they're not even hiding it. <laughs> they're not. That's what I'm saying. They're very blunt.
We right. just, people, you know what I mean? But yet we're trying to like prove them like, no, no, you don't understand it. That doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've seen that interview on how, um, in those marches in, in London, every Saturday, there's a march of, uh, uh, the free Palestine march, they call it, but they're all chanting genocidal chants. And it's, and someone was saying, I think it was Piers uh, Morgan was asking, was asked like about it. And he said, well, you know, they're not all pro Hamas. Um, and then the, the person he was interviewing said, well, you know, if you go once to a protest and you see people sh- chanting for the uh, racist slogans about black people, you probably wouldn't go next week, right? And if you go on the next week and they still chant the same chants, the same genocidal, you might not go the third time. But it's the fourth week that there were over 100 arrests over anti-Semitic slogans and jihadist uh, um, flags that were waved, ISIS, ISIS-like flags, and people still go. And that's like... That so your your issue is not with Israel. Your issue is clearly not with peace. You're going to a hate fest, knowing exactly what you're going to ex- to receive there, and you're supporting it. So I think you know at this point there's not really even a, a benefit of the doubt for anyone that stands with this because this is not about Palestine. It's not about peace. It's not about coexistence. It's just about saying everything you can to defame the Jewish nation, which is Israel. There aren't any other Jewish states in the world. It's 0.03% of the Middle East. There, there are many Arab countries in the Middle East. Yes, Palestinians are Arabs. I don't think any of them are going to deny it. Um, and it's, I mean, it's a different conversation to have, but I think People have completely forgot and 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 the conflict has been twisted so much, this geopolitics, to the point that people think that 7 million Jews in Israel are oppressing billions of uh, Muslims in the Middle East. Uh, and, and that this one tiny Jewish state is oppressing 22 Arab countries that are part of the Arab League and imperial force. And Israel is actually an empire, they're saying. And while Hamas is calling for a genocide, explicitly calling for a genocide, acting on it, we are the ones that are being accused of genocide. And instead of them having to prove that they that there are 10,000 people that were killed, we are the ones that need to be pro- to that are tasked with proving something that they streamed to the world to see. And they're still saying that we're lying. I mean... The world is completely upside down. No, the world's crazy is what it is. That's what I'm saying. Like this, like if you actually look at these things fact to fact, that's why like I, I half the day, it's so hard for me to focus on anything else because of the, I'm so outraged by the complete nonsense that what I'm seeing in the world, like I am just, I'm actually just shocked. Like you, you have these guys who are GoProing what happened, like literally GoPro, like they want you to see it. They've actually shown the world, hey world, this, look what we did. And yet people are still like, nah, I don't believe it. It's fake news. Like what is going on, Hen? What is going on? It's insane. And I think it also has to do with this generation of people that online, when they see someone with you know big followings and get a lot of engagement, they want to do the same. Uh, it's young people mostly that are not really educated. And uh, I mean, my friend Chai was saying it yesterday, how it's uh, people that snort, co- uh, snort cinnamon for clout. And uh, <laughs> we saw that. that interview. <laughs> I did, I did. <laughs> you posted it. Yeah, yeah, I did. Because <laughs> that's the point. Like, it's people that eat Tide Pods and and vo- videotape itself and then put it up on, on social media and they get a lot of likes and, and people uh, and people engage. But I think that's the generation that is about um, how will I get this capital of likes and engagement? And it's by being anti-Semitic. It's by being anti-Israel. I mean, TikTok is encouraging it. So that's... Mm-hmm. In, that's uh, what's happening they're they're actually the algorithm is favoring anything that says anti-israel and so therefore it's much more favorable for them to do that i saw that interview it was so funny because she's like don't be getting your facts from your hairstylist you know or like it was i thought it was i thought she did a great job with that interview you know that was really funny that was great like yeah. in a time when like it, it gave me some levity in a crazy time right now but um you know, like everyone needed it she's a comedian and it was like you know that's our superpower as jews it's all about finding ways to laugh that's exactly it i mean i love i I, and i and she made me laugh so um i think i think we're 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 just about i think we're done i think i asked i i showed you my outrage you know i'm and you you basically did a great job in trying to calm me down and or or give us some examples of or telling people jews be be proud be loud, 
uh, don't, don't be ashamed. Don't let gaslighting stop you. Like don't, don't waste your time with that. Be more productive. I think mm -hmm. that, um, I really, like I said, I, I, I really appreciate you being on this podcast and I think we kind of just, you kind of gave me all, all the stuff I need. So like, again, I, I commend you for doing a great job and, and keep going. Thank you. No, I mean, I just, if I have to finish with one thing is to remind people, remind the Jewish listeners and, and our allies that it's, we've been through so much in history. I mean, we're, I posted that how we've, you know, we came out of the ashes and we rose up like Phoenix. We're, we are a miracle. The, to be Jewish and alive is a miracle. It's nothing short of magic. And no matter what they've done to us, we always not only survive, we thrive every time. And it doesn't matter how hard they try. And Hamas is not going to be the ones that are going to end us. And people on TikTok are not going to be the ones that are going to end Jews. And their mean comments are not going to make us doubt ourselves. We're going to continue fighting. And that's what that's the meaning of Am Yisrael Chai, the people of Israel live. We continue living um, and nothing's going to stop that or change that. Thank you. I love that. Thank you, Han. You've been so nice and gracious. I appreciate it. It's so nice to meet you. Um, it, hold on, don't hang up. But I just want to say thank you for you know if, thank you for 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 coming on here, guys. Leave me some comments if you have any questions. Leave them in the comments. And um, again, thank you so much for for being on the podcast. Thanks for having me. And okay, so now we'll end it there, but I don't know how to stop the recording. I don't know how to do anything. It just, it. when I stop it, Jen, it'll just automatically send me the link to the recording. Okay, but I just wanted to finish. I just want to tell Han, okay, that's great. But I want to make sure I want to talk to you, Han, and say thank you again. Honestly, like, I think you're just so amazing. And I'm serious. You're like, you have such, you put out such amazing content. I literally, I all I do is like, press share, share, share on like everything. So uh, yeah, that's all I want. I really wanted to say you do a great job. And if there's anything I can be helpful to you, to your cause, if you I mean, I'm, I'm in all these groups as well. I'm sure like, you know, all these people are trying to like figure out ways to, 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 to change the narrative to change the branding of Jewish people. I'm in the same kind of situations as you are. I feel like everyone's working in a silo. If we can figure out a way to kind of uh, like kind of assimilate together as opposed to all these different powerful Jewish people working in, in, you know, in, in their, in their uh, corners, that would be, I think much more effective. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like there's, um, there's such a need for it, but um, it's just the last month. I mean, I've been preparing for crisis for a long time. We've, uh, I didn't say it, but like in May, 2021, when there was the first, like one of the recent cycles and that we saw how it affects the world. Then I said, okay, TLVI has to prepare for crisis and we have been preparing for it, but I've never imagined it to be that like bad as it is and how like that's, I mean, that's why our focus is just getting content out there for people to give them words and, and to, and yeah. I see how, like the content that I put out there, people would just, you know, and I'm telling them like plagiarize, use what I wrote and rewrite it and, and do whatever you need with this. Like right now, it's all about getting messages out there. So yeah, as much as I, we can do. As much as we can do. I mean, maybe you can, again, like I said, like we, we're all in these different corners. Maybe you can come in, in the group that I'm working in and kind of help with, you know, helping with messaging. What I'll do is um, I'm going to connect you with you on WhatsApp and maybe you and I can have a conversation offline, you know, yeah. um, in the next few days or next week or something. Absolutely. Yeah. No. And thank you for doing this. I know it's, um, it's not easy and it's, uh, for me, it's my livelihood. Like that's what I've been doing for, right. as, like for you. It's, you're just doing something because, and it takes so much strength. So I'm proud of you and thank you for doing that. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. And I mean, I appreciate that. Yeah. It's not, it hasn't been wonderful for my business, but that's besides the point. I sometimes, other things supersede that and uh it is what it is so thank you thank you so much i'm gonna call, i'm gonna text you I'll what's up you and we'll find a time to talk okay, perfect thank you so much shabbat shalom shabbat shalom bye, bye.